Uh, thank you. Uh, is that we now have Mastodon handles uh, for people to try out. I don't know how long that'll last either, but uh, it's the world we live in, I guess. And then the other is, I will turn off this video. And so that video up there is for share, is for chatting. And I'll turn it back on the breaks. And then for the presentation, you have that video. Okay, so um, that's me finished with my playing. Uh, nice to see everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, right, so uh, this is day three of OME 2022. Um, the title was uh, Next Generation Metadata, but I think what I'm actually doing after I finish the slides, so these are all new slides, um, was to see that we're actually making the case for next generation metadata. Uh, we're not quite there yet, but uh, hopefully um, we are a step further. If there are any confusions or anything you think should be added to all of this, please do feel free to, uh, to interrupt. I will probably ignore the chat and I will only focus on either people who speak up or raise their hands. And if someone on the team uh, sees you asking questions in the chat, they might stop me to, to have those verbally added to the video recording. Um, right, so let's get started. So unlike the other two days of workshops, this isn't really immediately about NGFF. Um, at some point, we kind of we diverge, and there are two parallel tracks that we're dealing with here. On the one hand, it's it's generating or building a next generation file format, and then what we're talking about today is really how can we move our metadata forward at the same time. And and if NGFF is somewhere along the path towards whatever the next gen future is, uh, this conversation is a bit behind. But hopefully, they will meet at some point in the future, um, and we'll bring this all back together again. At that point, we probably needed to, to re-examine the name Next Gen, uh, and I'm not exactly sure what that's going to be, uh, but we'll do that when we get there. So at a very high level, what we're really talking about uh, is linked data, which is more or less another name for FAIR. You know, how do we take our data sets and integrate them with other existing data sets, other existing data resources? Um, so for everyone who is there, you may remember, and if you weren't there, you can get caught up um, at this bit.ly address. Um, last year at OME 2021, during the Research Data Management Day, I inv invited Andra Wagmeister to talk about his project or a project that he works on called GeneWiki, which is taking genetic information and putting it in the public space. And he particularly uses Wikidata um, as that location for, for where he's going to store all the metadata that he's, that he's linking. Um, Wikidata, if you don't know, is a um, data platform that sits behind Wikipedia um, and is probably the largest, certainly the most prominent um, linked data resource that's, that's on the web with over 12 billion individual statements or triples, as we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but from what's important for us to maybe realize is that this is just, so Wikidata is just one open data set, linked open data set, um, and part of this grander linked open data cloud. Uh, so as of last year, there were over 1,300 data sets, and you can kind of see the progression here. So there ever being more and more of these data sets. And, and each of the links between the data sets are two data sets saying, OK, we're going to actually talk about, uh, talk about each other, reference data sets um, or data points somewhere else in the cloud. Um, the life science. Um, subset of this cloud includes resources like Uniprot and PubChem, certainly things that we use in the IDR. Um, and I think the, the question that we're asking here is, what do we need to do with our metadata to become part of this cloud? So you know, what are the, the steps it takes, um, both at the level of our metadata schemas, so how we talk about our data, but also the data itself to have it linked together with, with other forms of um, information. So the, the, the individual circles, the nodes here in this graph, and we'll see lots of kind of ball and stick diagrams um, throughout this presentation, um, because that's how I talk about metadata, are the ones that are in the bioimaging space. It's ones that we know about. We, we, we or at least I you know have a feeling for how these two things work together, um, but there are probably many others and I, had, I didn't even try to think of all of them, um, that we want to, to add on. And so the question we're probably starting with 
is just how do, can we harmonize them? What are the relationships that are, that are here between these metadata um, specifications? And then eventually, some helps. Oh, interesting. So maybe someone can help uh, Jeffrey. Um, and eventually what we would be talking about is what are the other resources kind of outside of our bioimaging space that we really want to fo focus on in terms of um, our linkages and how do we go about sharing that data? You know, does Omero become a linked data resource? Does the IDR? Um, there are lots of questions to ask and we're really just starting down this path. All right, so what are we actually going to talk about for the next, um, I guess, hour and a half or so? Um, I'll start off and I'll give a super short introduction to linked data. Um, anyone who's put up with me for any amount of time, and for, I guess, unfortunately, for many of you, that's several years for, for you, uh, you will know I will be talking about RDF. It's just what I do. Um, so I'll, I'll give an introduction to that as well. And then we'll talk about, well, why is now a particularly good time for us to be building this case for next generation metadata? What are the problems or the opportunities maybe in this space? So what are the features that you and or your users um, may be interested in? Um, and then talk about solutions. So certainly everything that we've tried in the past from, from the OME point of view to make our data, our, our meta metadata representations flexible and extensible um, kind of on this path, but why that didn't succeed and why we now need to talk about the next generation. And if we have extra time and we are interested, maybe what we do is we try to pick out some of these other metadata schemas that we're interested in trying to interoperate with. So i.e. you tell us what you're interested in um, and then perhaps also define the relationships between them. So what we really need to know is, you know, um, the IDR is going to be built on the OME metadata, BIA will use this part of the IDR metadata, et cetera, et cetera. We need to, eventually we will need to have all of that well worked out, um, but that's probably a little bit much to do today. All right, um, I don't see any raised hands and I'll just keep going. Like I said, feel free to interrupt. So if you Google for linked data, one of the first things you will find is this five-star data de based definition. Um, it gives a nice kind of visual of, of the feeling of we're trying to make things more and more linkable. You start off and you put your, your data point, whatever it may be, here it's a PDF on the web um, with an open license. That means people can get have access to it. Um, you then make your, da uh, your data as structured as possible. So here, a spreadsheet as opposed to just PDF. Then you make it available in a non-proprietary open format. Uh, these are... Um, ideas that we've talked about for many years in the bioimaging space. Um, and then it starts to become a little bit more uh, unique. You try to talk about everything with URI. So you want a URL, <clears throat> excuse me, a URL that you can actually resolve when you're talking about any of the, the, the pieces of data or information in your space. Um, and then finally, once you have all of that in a stack, then you can then start linking data together and you have linked open data. Okay, so obviously for the URIs that talks about RDF. So what's this RDF thing I keep talking about? Thank you for asking. Um, I'll go through very briefly an example from the RDF primer, which is one of the um, core documentation pieces from the W3C. Um, you could imagine, although certainly trying to develop these same kind of examples uh, using our own data. So maybe that's something we'll do in the future. Um, Fundamentally, RDF is a graph, so that's why we have these ball and these stick figures. Here, the example given um, is this person, Bob, and you know there's a information about him and about relationships that he has to other people that he's interested in the Mona Lisa, um, and that that was created by Leonardo da Vinci, and that the Mona Lisa is a subject of some movie. That's fine. The graph is the natural way to represent these things, but of course, uh, for many cases, it will be easier to then write that down in sentences. And you kind of go through and you take each of these subjects of a triple and the arrow that it's um, uh, that you find and you follow it, and then you can write a sentence. And so Bob is a person, Bob is a friend of Alice, et cetera, et cetera. And the real trick then is to write those down formally as triples. Um, and that always comes in the form of a subject, a predicate, and an object. Um, Subjects are always URIs. So here you have references to these well-defined things. So that's your identifier. You can use DOIs or other persistent identifiers. 
Um, same for the predicates, i.e. the verb or the, the adjectives. Um, they are always URIs. Um, and then you have the objects of the sentence, and that can either be entities, so that, again, URIs, or you can have values, and those can be well-typed. Um, so here you have a date. It's not just a string, 1990704, which could be misinterpreted. You actually have the, the typed information that you want to pass along. And that's really it when it comes to you know, what is RDF. Um, as a bonus, that really is uh, basically the same representation as a table. So you have your subjects, which are rows, um, the predicates are your columns, and then you have your values as the, the individual cells. And the differences are that there are, it's very sparse. So a graph need not have, try to have every single column for a given subject. Um, the values are linked data. So they are, so everything in the, in the angle brackets are references somewhere else. And the values are typed. Um, but it, I guess in, in trying to make it not something scary, um, it, it, you know, thinking of everything as a table, although you will need several tables to represent RDF, tends to, tends to help. Um, so although that, those are the, the, the basics of RDF and linked data, I think what makes this um, fairly convincing as a platform that we might want to build the rest of our, our ever higher level specifications on top of is the fact that it's also a W3C standard. So much like HTML or CSS or um, XML things that are widely used, um, they are also standardized by the W3C. So RDF is kind of like the XML in the semantic web space, but it's the graph and it's a abstract representation as opposed to saying, this is exactly how you must write it down. And then additional specifications say, well, this is how you would write it down if you want to do X. So the representation we were looking at is called turtle for terse triples. There's also JSON LD, which we'll talk about several times, um, which is a bit more developer friendly. So you kind of choose how you're going to represent everything, but each of the graphs are completely identical to one another um, semantically. And then you have more higher level, more powerful kind of specifications. There's the web ontology language. Uh, which is like XSD, um, Sparkle, which is like XML, uh, sorry, SQL, or perhaps XPath. So how do you query across your graphs? Um, there are specifications for how to deal with uh, tables that are stored on the web um, and also how to deal with catalogs. So something like the IDR, there are ways, kind of well-defined ways in the community and tools that work with them to say, here's a list of data sets I want to share those. So these are all things that we could build on top of and not need to start from, from scratch. But what I'll talk about, so those are all very nice to have, and I think they are things we can look at. Uh, but what I think RDF does, and I know of no, nothing else that provides this, and so maybe this is kind of a open call for, for someone to prove me wrong, is it's, it's the least common denominator. So it's the... Uh, for the computationalists, it's the machine language, and maybe the biologists will live with or could deal, will accept the amino acid metaphor. I, I haven't got, so I haven't heard a better suggestion yet, but please correct me. Um, but it's a, it's the lowest way that you can encode all the information you want to speak about, ne not necessarily the most uh, performant. So you may need to build other things that are more performant. And you may want to build higher levels of abstraction. You don't want to always be working at the machine language or the amino acid level. You want to build up vocabularies and higher level frameworks to make your word possible. So I guess that's what I'm proposing is that we start down the path of building up those higher level um, representations. So I'll read a quote here real quick. Um, People think that RDF is a pain because it is complicated. The truth is even worse. RDF is painfully simplistic, but it allows you to work with real world data and problems that are horribly complicated. While you can avoid RDF, it is harder to avoid complicated data and complicated computer problems. So that's from Dan Brickley at Google and Libby Miller from the BBC, uh, who wrote a book called Validating RDF, which is actually, I think, available completely uh, open online. So a question, sorry, if oh. you accept question during the presentation. Sure. Yeah, Katarina has a hand raised. Just a clarification. Uh, yeah. For the least common denominator we are looking for is basically the triples. I mean, in, in this world, it would be the triples. Yeah, it's it's the representation 
that we can all agree on. So, you know, anyone who would be producing a, a representation of metadata, how would they write it down? And so, yeah, so I guess I'm making the argument that the RDFs are the simplest thing. And if we can always convert whatever we're producing down into RDF, then we will be able to link it back together. Then there are questions of what you do after that. But if that's always the basis for all the other choices we make, then we can work towards interoperability. Okay, great, thank you. So let's look at um, kind of an example. This is one that uh, Jason and I came up with for a previous, um, I think this was a welcome trust grant. Um, so, the, you know, if, if the deliverable of the grant is to be able to represent all of a, a, an experiment in one here unified bioimage um, package, then you want to be able to list, you know, the information about the entire life cycle of this image and its, um, its source and its, its results. Um, and I'll kind of walk through this graph. So you start off and you have some kind of biosample tissue or something um, that has been acquired that has been treated with an agent. The sample has been treated with an agent N. Um, we know that that has a knocked out gene. That gene lives in an, in an external resource. So we don't have to store any of the information that's outside of this bio image inside of our, our package, but we can just reference it by URI. So this sample was imaged to produce an image. It was imaged with a particular life path that was corrected by a deformable mirror. Um, that image was imaged with a camera that has some um, uh, calibration information up here, QC. The image was then analyzed by some pipeline P and we found a hit that has a confidence rate of 90%. And then we bundle all of that together and we give it a URI. So this bundle has a maybe a DOI, for example. Um, and then it gets published in some online resource. So this could possibly be the IDR itself would have its own uh, representation. And so these are all of the triples that are kind of a, a realistic um, use case of what, my, what any regular user might want to represent. Um, in this morning, so I presented exactly that in this morning, um, this morning session and Will brought up, well, that doesn't really necessarily tell the user what, what he or she may need to do uh, to represent that. So I've tried to add this in here that, so I guess the expectation on the user, so a lot of this is, is from the developer point of view. So what are the systems we want to build in order to help our users uh, capture their knowledge? Um, but there will be requirements on the users, right? There will be interaction. Um, so at import time, for example, you could imagine how do you, how do you add the fact that a, a particular image, uh, sorry, that a particular sample was used for these images that you're importing? Do you have a barcode that you're scanning? Does the imaging system itself know the information of the sample? Um, those are all problems that we're going to need to figure out. And then once someone has added these triples, so so all let's say someone has gone through the work of actually, you know. Um, adding all of this rich metadata, how are you going to be able to search for? I mean, the search for a gene, for example, is fairly straightforward, but will you want to search for, you know, via some of the other calibration information? Certainly the, the groups at Coriplimi, that's what they're talking about. Um, but we will need to know. So what are those, those use cases from your point of view in terms of what you would actually like to do with this information? And then maybe one of the key things that we're trying to achieve with all of this, so this framework that we're talking about, would be that at the end of the day, when you've done this, like, you know, let's say you've taken the time and you've actually encoded all of this information into your data sets, will you be able to hit, you know, the magic button and share this with either the bioimage archive or with the IDR or some other publishing resource? So those are the kinds of features that we're trying to enable um, but a lot of this conversation really is, is all of us who are building these systems for you taking a step back and going, okay, <laughs> to build things of ever higher levels of complexity, um, we really need a common framework that we can all use together. All right, any questions at that point? So this is kind of, that was an attempt to get across kind of the grand vision of where we're going. Um, and from here we get into why now? Okay, I don't see hands going up. I'll keep going. Um, so you may or may not have heard, so an announcement went out uh, last week that NFDI for bioimage was funded. 
Um, and I want to take a little time to explain why that's uh, relevant here, because these are kind of exactly the issues that we will be working on. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, the NFDI is the National Research Data Initiative here in Germany. Um, it was set up um, on the order of three or four years ago with a plan to fund up to 30, 30 consortia who are tasked with really linking research outputs across Germany. Um, so that's everything from, you know, obviously bioimaging now um, and physics and uh, chemistry, but all the way into the humanities, um, some of the um, earth sciences, uh, I, I think you can read them for yourself. So these are the list of the, the, the 19 projects that were funded in the first two rounds. Um, I guess kind of is proof that these are people who really like metadata. Um, they've encoded themselves in Wikidata. And so there is a query that you can type in and find uh, the 19 existing consortia. Um, and I will do everything I can to make sure that uh, NFDI for bioimage gets added here uh, in the next while. Uh, but until then, I have a map that I stole from Stephanie Weitkamp-Peters, who is the spokesperson for NFDI for bioimage. And I'll talk very briefly about um, how that is set up. So there are 11 applicant institutions across six task areas. Um, and I'll get into what those task areas are specifically supposed to be doing here in a bit. Um, NFDI for bio, uh, sorry, NFDI itself does not provide hardware. So the grants weren't for, you know, saying we have some kind of uh, centralized storage that we're going to use to share everyone's data. But of course you do want to build systems. We want to, to launch Omeros and, and start sharing data. So there are two IT infrastructures that are involved, um, both in Munster and in uh, Freiburg. And I think I saw some people from Munster who showed up. Um, in case there are any questions. The participating institutions um, are written into the grant and they will receive you know, someone to help them implement their use cases locally. So we try to cover a number of modalities um, across the bioimaging spectrum. But the real key of making everything happen is, is having a team of data stewards and research software engineers who are then kind of um, responsible for all the use cases and certainly the data stewards going um, across Germany and making the data fair and available. And then there are a number of community use cases, which are just, you know, and I think um, actually those are partially international. So saying there's something that a, a missing need in the community and how do we go about representing that? And there'll be a process for, for writing up um, proposals for other use cases that need implementing. Um, all of that though, is with the same basic objectives of standardizing bioimaging um, the bioimage data type itself, um, building up infrastructure for for the fair for fair data, uh, making workflows reproducible, and capacitating researchers, so training and and outreach. Now, none of that, um, so obviously it's doing that for Germany, but none of that is particularly German specific, and so that's why I think it's it's appropriate for this conversation. Um, these are the task areas and the institutions that are um, that make them up. Uh, Susanna Kunis and I will be leading task area one. What and that also means that my affiliation in the new year switches to German bioimaging. So what that doesn't mean is that work stops on all these things for open microscopy. Um, but hopefully, so I guess from my point of view, it means that we have more people who are kind of a, who are attempting to achieve the same goals. Um, so maybe that's something we can also talk about, because to some extent, all of this is, is on a constant progression, right? So uh, from the early days of OME, we've been building up um, the specifications and the ability for, for us to do um, more and more interesting things. Uh, that includes IDR and the Bioimage Archive and, and getting bigger and more linked. Um, and hopefully we can take this to ever greater limits. So these are kind of this is the, the, the sales pitch from the, uh, from the proposal. Um, and I'm happy to talk about any of that, but now I'll come back down to, to kind of the specifics of what it is we are actually planning on doing. Um, so one of the, the, the areas, one of the, thing, uh, the requirements of the proposal was to have a research data management plan for the particular domain, so for bioimaging, um, and to show how the task areas represent um, each of the, the principles of the fair 
um, or each of the fair principles. So what we saw though was that um, RDF itself actually covers many of the requirements. And so that's kind of why RDF keeps showing up here in linked data is that if we use it as this basis for what we're building um, for a particular area, then we don't need to start from scratch and build new infrastructure. So you can imagine I'm not very keen to build new file formats or new um, specifications when, when there are those that already exist. Where RDF doesn't cover it, so RDF is for metadata, um, for example, so for, for the FAIR principles for the data side, obviously we'll be introducing NGFF and all the things we've been talking about in the other days of the session, and then really look at bringing those together. So task area one is tasked with this, is building this idea of a FAIR image object, FAIR IO. Um, it's really not a surprise that you have, you know, similar to that first use case that we talked through, you have some form of bundle, it has an identifier, it has metadata that's in it, and within it you have, you know, the really complex imaging data that we all know and I guess love, um, and there's a way for you to share that with the community, right? Um, but again, nothing new here, so this is, to some extent, branding to make sense of the FAIR digital object movement. So there's if you don't know, there is a growing uh, body of specification around the sphere digital object. Uh, you can see how, I mean, this is in 3D, or this is in 2D, but it's the same general principle. Um, there aren't con concrete implementations of, of fair digital objects that I think we can start using today, um, but I think we can work towards and really be a part of this movement as it grows. So this is something that it might be interesting for us to watch. And we'll certainly be doing that as well. And then the other task area is task area three, which is dealing with multimodal uh, information. So linking these fair image objects into other representations and making it possible to search over them. So those are the types of things that we will be um, building and hopefully making available to everyone. But again, so from our point of view, this is very much a, a global initiative so these, so the recent nature methods focus issue on reproducibility could also have been called, you know, could have been a feature on FAIR or research data management. All the concepts that are so key to what we're talking about here are represented. Um, these are the six that members, so applicants of NFDI for bioimage uh, were authors on. But of course, there are other articles that are important and, you know, co-authors of all of these include many of you. And so I think it's it's a particularly good time. So it's there are things that we're very interested in achieving here. Um, and I guess I'm making the argument that as with the file formats, where there was you know to move to the cloud, we really needed that next step to to make to bring us something that was scalable, and we were all going to be able to work with. The same problem underlies all the work with the metadata we really need a common framework so that we can then build ever more sophisticated and complicated forms of information representation really um, together and kind of work and work together on building the tools to make those easy for our users to, to, um, to access. All righty, that was kind of the high level. I'll shift gears into some concrete use cases. Or I think, I hope concrete, if there are no questions. I don't see any hands raised. All right. So I'll start off and there'll be a little bit, so a little bit of a linkage to NGFF and then we'll kind of get into ontologies and schemas and things. Um, this is the, the same data life cycle that we saw earlier. Um, start with image acquisition and you go around to eventually hopefully image reuse with ever more data under management. That's roughly how these are spelled out. Um, so as I said, talking about files and then Mero, ontology schemas. And then to the extent possible, you know, so I guess here's a participation warning, either by interrupting me, if you have things that you want to, um, features that you think, or you know that your users need, by all means, bring them up. Um, but there's also a HackMD that we can work on if we have time towards the end. And we can try to um, build up ever more ideas of what, what the use cases are for linking our metadata, right? All right, so I'll start off with one. So this is not a new slide. So we've seen this for many years. Um, 
the, the standard kind of bioformats problem that we have a large number of, of proprietary file formats and bioformats job is to read all of those and create a common uh, representation. And part of that is generating OME XML. And I've left that out here. But there's also this representation of everything else. So what, what are all the metadata um, items from an original file format that we can't represent in OME XML? And all of that gets listed in these key value pairs that are called you know, original metadata. And so I guess if, if our goal was to be able to read as much vendor data as possible, um, one thing I would like for, I, and I think we would all like for the common metadata framework here to do is allow the vendors to tell us what that metadata is. So, so it's no longer bioformat and bioformat's responsibility, i.e. members of the team's responsibility to try to figure out what that metadata is about, but there would be a way for vendors to, to communicate with the community, here's what our metadata is and here's how it's going to be written down. And so this kind of, this is JSON LD. So this kind of representation as an example would be extensible. It would allow the vendors to have their own namespace and take control of it. And they would be responsible for set, setting down what the metadata is gonna look like. It would be embeddable in that we could have information from either um, from the core OME model plus the vendor, or you, I guess conceivably you could have information from multiple vendors Say if the um, the camera is producing metadata from the camera vendor and the microscope from the microscope vendor, all of that can be linked together. And importantly, it's expressive in the sense that it's no longer just a key value pair that needs to be to be shown, but you actually have a data syntax here. So you have arrays and you have dictionaries, and you can you can structure your data um, in a deep and uh, significant way. So. That's one of the things I assume we want out of this framework. Um, something else is, um, and it's really a part and parcel of the same representation, um, is to move us past the, the, the situation we're in now with OME TIFF. So this is kind of the technical specification of OME TIFF. Um, and I use it because there is exactly one place in OME TIFF that we can put the metadata that we're using, which is called image description. And we put a block of OME XML in the image description and that turns a, a regular TIFF file into an OME TIFF. Um, and if someone else wanted to link their own information into, um, into that file, there would be a bit of a question how to do that. They can overwrite the image data uh, image description tag, but then it's no longer an OME TIFF. Um, they can add sidecar files. I guess they could try to add things into the OME XML representation, um, but there's no clear way on how someone would go about doing these things. And so um, we could work on it, but it's but it's a weakness of the framework itself in the saying, how do we actually let them represent it? Um, Czar with its, sorry, I froze for a second, with its metadata representation lets us then encode exactly this block of um, JSON that I was showing a second ago. That's probably the best way forward, but there are other options. There's always the option of adding a sidecar file um, beside the czar directory, but there are then also other locations within the uh, the czar directory, uh, like the OME, like Bioformats to RAW is doing with the OME metadata XML file. So we 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 have we have choices that we can make, and hopefully this would allow multiple tools, multiple vendors to all structure their information into one single file. All right. Oh, yeah. Go for it, Katarina. I think Eric was just before me. Oh, okay. Go for it, Eric. Um, I guess my question is, what happens if the vendors don't? What's the what's the contingency there? Um, is there a contingency there? Because realistically, I don't think the vendors will. I hope they will. I hope they get they see the light and they they come on board. Realistically, I don't know. Go for it, Katarina. Uh, actually, uh, Quareb is. Um, so I wanted to say a couple of things, but one one of the things uh, to res to to respond to what Eric was saying, the Quareb is actually changing the realistic 
um, the, re the realism uh, equation here. So we actually have uh, engaged uh, camera manufacturers in this conversation. They are actually, we are actually reviewing NBOQ with their input. So, and so it's actually happening. Um, so it, which makes it even more important that we develop a tool for, uh, sorry, a framework, a next generation metadata framework so that they can provide us this information. The other comment that I had was, um, because I mean, so clearly we do need to have um, a way for manufacturers to provide the metadata that they want to provide, but we're also working very hard to make sure we agree with them of what metadata the community wants to have, wants to have, and is needed by the community, so that we can have like um, some metadata that is agreed upon, similar to what is now the OMI model, let's say, so that. We, we all we all, this this kind of metadata we all we all agree that we want together and then there is additional metadata that they can provide and we give them the opportunity to provide both the agreed upon metadata and the metadata they want. Yeah. Hi, um, look, I just want to comment because uh, these days uh, at the very same time as at, as the OME uh, uh, meeting, there are also the um, ISO microscopy ISO committee meetings, and I just want to confirm to you that there is an interest from the vendors and manufacturers to start working on these issues. So there's hope. So yeah, I uh, I like saying there's hope, and I guess there's also a particular responsibility. So kind of answering or responding to Eric, um, you know, I think if we can come to a consensus and start building, you know, that's probably building um, some initial libraries, but also the documentation and kind of the proof that this is going to work, it will get easier. They, they I guess it is natural that companies will be slower to react. Um, and I'd like to make the case to the best extent that we can. Anyone else on that? So oh, it's obviously uh, near and dear to lots of us. Okay, I'll keep going. Uh, and actually, you know, I guess it's good at this point that. Oh. So I'll go ahead and turn on Eric's face. Since, uh... <laughs> so this is the next use case, which is one that has come up for many years for a long period of time. Um, sorry, frequently for a long period of time, um, which is how do you get everything you need out of Omero? So in case you don't know, so this is kind of a one of the early-ish or mid to early-ish uh, representations of all the stuff that is in an Omero. So, you know, when you import an image into an Omero, it's not just the OME XML that kind of gets abstracted and stored to the to the database. Eventually, as your users, you know, are, are working um, with the data, they add, they can add files and the annotations, and, and there becomes kind of this, this amalgam of things that belong together. And not all of those have a place. In, in an OME TIFF, for example. So we have no great way to export them. Um, it's something we've known about and worked on for many years. Um, and Eric just came along and just kind of did something. And I think that's amazing. So uh, by all means, try out Omero CLI transfer. Uh, it's a command line tool. You give it the either a project. Here's the, the so the a type, a project or data set or image, et cetera and its identifier, and it will a directory that it then downloads everything to and packs that all up either into a tar file or a zip file. Um, and in that, you have the original files that Omero has stored internally. You have some other information stored in HDF5, which I guess that surprised me, Eric, but we can talk about that later. Um, and then you have an OME XML file, which makes sense. And you can, you know, there's another command called unpack that will let you um, import this into a new Omero. So you can take all of your data. Now, all the data that, that this tool supports out of one Omero, and you can send it to another. That's great. I think that's something that many people want. The two questions I think that are important for this conversation when it comes to Omero CLI transfer are, um, one, what happens when we start adding more metadata into the bundle? So let's say over here, we add a triple store, for example, into the back end. 
what happens um, here in the directory? Do you just download this graph of information? And where does that graph of information get cut, right? So what, what part of the metadata do we send to the new server? Um, and the other question is probably how do we standardize this format? So is this bundle of information something that we want um, more people to be building on? So you know, getting back to the vendors, is this something how we would want them to ship things around? Um, there is a flag, dash dash B archive, that when it generates the bundle is something that you can submit to the bioimage archive. Uh, is Matthew here? Um, so I presented that this morning, you know, and there was lots of nodding going on. Oh, I guess Ibuka, you're here, right? So, you know, that's a, a very interesting feature, and it may actually drive the standardization of the of the this little bundle of information. Um, but we need to make sure that we're ready to capture all of the metadata. So um, so I think this is one of those examples of a really good step along the, the direction that we want to go. And now it's the question, where do we go from here? Does anyone want, want to jump in on this? Violentations come on. Right. All right, I'll keep going. We can always come back to these. Um, Something else then in general that you want to be able to do is to make use of an ontology. This is actually one of the pretty easy ones um, in the grand scheme of things. Um, so I took the, the list of ontologies that are listed in RIMBY, which as I understand it is basically the Bioimage Archives ontology list. Um, if it's not, feel free to correct me. Um, and the IDR's ontology list from Francis, excuse me. Um, and this is kind of a representation of where there's overlap. So that's NCBI, FBBI, um, and EFO are kind of the three ontologies that get used between both of them. OME here is a schema, not an ontology, but we'll get to that in just a minute. You know, and, and, and ontologies themselves, at least those represented in, in, say, the OLS, are actually fairly easy to make use of in a linked metadata world because they already give you a URI. You know, there is a well-defined um, identifier that you can use places. This happens to be from, uh, what is it? Uh, the yeast ontology mating type A. That was the first EFO uh, entry I could find in the IDR. Um, at least for the IDR's purposes, though, I think we, so again, we're, we're, we're on a trajectory somewhere. And what is it that we want to do as the next feature here? Um, currently, if you wanted to query the IDR for that term, you would need to know that there's a key somewhere called EFO space term and that what you will find there is the, the EFO value, um, but only the identifier, not the full string. So what would it look like to start using um, these entire strings? Does a, would we ask users to go to the OLS? For anyone who doesn't know, the OLS is the ontology lookup service at the EBI, um, and, and search for ontology terms and then paste those into, for example, IDR or into Omero. So how is it that we expect our users to really engage with, with ontologies? Um, and again, obviously I'm working towards the fact that I think the, the linked metadata will make that easier. Go ahead. I, I... Um, yeah, I just actually wanted to mention that we realized today that um, the FFBI links were broken. Oh. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, this, this will link to the whole um, linked data. Um, and uh, various problems that uh, was uh, has come up in the morning session as well. So, yeah, it's fair. So maybe I'll go ahead and do that right now. So the I'm definitely focusing on the positives of linked data. Um, there are downsides, and the big downsides are with in a federated system you have to trust. The, oh, hello, cat. Uh, the URLs to not disappear, um, and there are can be performance issues. As I mean, I. I guess compare Mastodon as you must trust each of the individual resources to be up at all times and to be performant. Um, and those are hard problems. So yeah, no good solutions there. Katerina? Yeah, just to, un to clarify, to understand um, this issue. So if the link breaks, uh, then that means, so what does that do? So I mean, can we still have the, so I guess if you just link at a, to a pure, URI, you don't, you, it's not, unless there is a link that is not human readable in any way anymore, at least. Right. So for an ontology term, 
um, yeah, if it breaks, so if the, if for example, the OLS goes down, really it's a problem for the user. They can't click on it and go and see what does this term actually mean, which isn't mm. great, but it's not horrible. And then you can build, you know, someone can take over that ontology and say, okay, well, I'm going to host the website that will tell people what it means. But um, for, and we've had to do this, you know, in the IDR, that then means going through and updating all of the URLs from one version to another or fixing HTTP to HTTPS, you know, there are very real costs um, mm -hmm. of, of keeping up with all of these things. And so you, you know, that comes back to funding. We want these things to be well-funded and we also want to trust the ones that we're using. So the choice of these things is as important. So, um, and if we as a community think one of the resources isn't very trustable, then we may want to duplicate the effort or get involved and spend some of our either time or money making sure that they are healthy and happy, right? So it's just something to be aware of. Mm -hmm. Thanks. All right. So let's talk about the difference between ontologies and schemas, because I think here's um, where we need even more help. So ontologies describe the world. Um, and so far we've talked about, or we just talked about ontologies and schemas are for describing the data. Um, and so OME, for example, is more of a schema. So it it's much more interested in, in, in kind of defining how the data is going to be structured and lay out than trying to say, you know, precisely what um, say each of the pieces of a microscope is. Um, in looking at RIMBY, so again, this is, so I guess this is now the reference to RIMBY. Um, there are a list of, of um, here it says standards and ontologies that are that are suggested for being used. Um, like I said, the, all the all the ones that are coming from an ontology, I think, are generally um, feasible. Um, some of the ones that are coming from the OME schema are fairly straightforward. You know, getting uh, the pixel size out of bioformats bio formats reads an imaging file. There are some metadata that you are just going to be able to trust because if you don't trust it, you're not going to be able to look at the image, right? I mean, that's what Bioformats does. Um, there are areas of the OME schema and other schemas that are less well defined, and things will get tricky. So, um, one of those is channel information, and I'll show some examples a little bit later. Um, that's an area where, as a community, we probably want to spend the time and either update the OME schema with a model of channel information, or maybe someone else takes the responsibility and says, okay, I want to build a schema model uh, for channels, and I'm going to do that. And so I would hope that the framework that we're talking about here would allow us to make that choice and actually look at how to do that. Um, in the morning session, so I, I was hoping to kind of spend a little bit of time doing that. Uh, we ran out of time, and so I don't think we'll get to it. But you know, I think that's a conversation, the type of conversation we could have. We could set aside a couple of hours to sit around for those people who are interested um, with the right framework and actually write down exactly what does, what should be stored in, in a channel. Now, we'll probably fight about it for a couple of months after that, but it's kind of the fun kind of conversation that you can have, or you could at least start over a beer. Finishing it's much more difficult. Um, and then, so kind of the last... Uh, one of these concrete use cases, and it's it's one of the main drivers for why, why I desperately think we need a framework like this. Um, what happens if you actually want to extend a schema? And so this is um, uh, this is the 40 and Bina. Um, was Quorup included in in this paper already, Katarina? I think so. So the NBO no, Q this, schema. This was the NBO without this Quorup. This was NBO without. no Q. Okay, so. To, to explain the pro pro progression, so this attempt to extend the OME model, so the OME instrument model started off with the 4DN uh, consortium and then BINA joined and then it was the 4DN BINA extension to OME and then it became the 4DN BINA Quora Plimi extension to OME. So that's now NBOQ. So um, it's kind of a mouthful, but uh, so is NGFF. So, you know, so be it. Um, Long story short, what they were attempting to do is to take the classes, so the, the concepts that existed in the OME schema. So here you have like light source, objective, instrument, detector, um, things that we know from the OME side, and extend those. So how do you inject more metadata into an, into an existing schema? Um, unfortunately, the way that OME XML is structured, i.e. it's written with, um, with XSD, 
um, doesn't give you many options. So when you are thinking about the, the, the files that you can actually produce at the end of the day, you could produce a NB, NBOQ XML that references an OME XML, but exactly how you do the referencing is unclear. Um, you could take an entire OME XML and put it inside of a NBOQ XML, but it's also same problem. How do you reference things that are inside of yourself? Um, or you could just copy all of, you know, copy the entire XSD and add to it, but software that works with um, this representation or a software that works with OME XML wouldn't know how to deal with this representation. So that's the, the, the ultimate basis of the flexibility, the, the extensibility problem is how do we write um, our metadata in such a way that a, a different community can come along and say, well, I wanna add some metadata to that. I know some more things um, and we can keep all the, all the linkages between the different parts of the metadata consistent um, and we can keep all of our code working without you know, completely breaking our backs. So that's ultimately the goal of, of what we're trying to achieve here. Um, this is the list of all the extra stuff. Um, oh, sorry, that came up during the morning session. So I think I added a couple of these, and then we kind of went around and around. And I can explain these if you want. But I guess first I would open the floor if anyone else at least immediately has the feeling, oh yeah, if we did this, well, if we had this framework, here's what I would want to do with it. Did anyone? And no is a fine answer. Um, what we might do then is go ahead and take a break. Uh, you can think during the break. You don't have to think during the break. And then everyone will get a chance to add to this list if they want when we come back. And if not, we will go on with um, kind of some of the more concrete uh, solutions past and present. And I propose we can start back at, say, five after the hour. There I am. Okay, welcome back everyone. So, Frederick, do you wanna kick us off and talk about DMPs? Yes, sorry. Yeah, it's me who was talking about DMP. Just because in, I was involved in France in something like that, so <laughs> I was thinking about this because the goal I think was also to, in when you when you start to do a project, you you describe what you want to use and you describe what data you are going to 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 get. And uh, while while describing this, after you will get the images and the, the other data, and all will be together at the end. I think, I suppose. This is a, a goal, a long-term goal, I think, but... Um... And is the data management plan uh, accessible somewhere? So is it actually something you could link to? Uh, or would no, you... not really. It's uh, it's a global uh, work on, uh, on a, uh, a GMP for, for platforms. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's written in a DSW uh, data steward wizard. And it's on work, in fact. So I, I don't know this at this stage, I could share something with you, but uh, the goal is to do a structured DMP uh, for bioimaging or multiomics. And mm -hmm. uh, after it should be a machine actionable system uh, for the project that the people that, when they start a project, they will. They will check the cases. And the um, they will check what they use, what platform they use, and then they will get automatically the the informations about the, the the instruments or the type of data they and the the pre written DMP from the platforms. In fact, for their project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would be interesting to know whether or not we could interoperate with those. Okay, it would, it would definitely be good to look at. And the yeah the. The, the file that you can export from these tools is JSON files, I think. Mm -hmm. So it's a, like it's a, it like I think a common common type of uh, files that you use everywhere no? now. I think. Yeah, I would think so. Interesting. Thanks. Thank you.
Anyone else on DMPs or any of these other points or a new thought whatsoever? I on the DMP slightly. So astronomy has the system of the observation blocks, um, which is obviously different because there are um, just a certain number of telescopes, which are um, then managed by bigger organizations and you have to apply um, for time. And then if you get a successful application, then you do write these observation blocks similar to data management plans as to where you will observe and so on. And then all these data are then written, um, all the metadata is then written into the, um, the headers of, of your data eventually when the observation is done at the telescope. So you automatically get it back. So I think it's a, a very good system to implement um, as at least for the you know big um, microscopy facilities that share mm -hmm. their resources. Well, hold on. I'm not sure who was first. I think Katharina was first. But... Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, in. Um... So Judith can actually uh, jump in and if she's still here, but um, there is definitely the attempt by the Open um, Science Consortium, I think it's called, to um, to push the idea of of um, it's not it's I mean it's similar to a data management plan, but it's not called a data management plan. The idea is to publish your a study design uh, ahead of time. Um, which it would be cool if that would be then linked to an actual data management plan, in which the metadata is defined and the uh, structures are, are created. Um, along the line, along this line uh, in with Judith and with people at uh, Canada Bioimaging, so we are working on a Canada-wide um, instance of, of Omero and in order to um, which is, we're just at the pilot phase completely. So it's really start just starting, but the idea is that we wanna have um, definitions of templates of the part that has to do with the experimental context, the, um, the, the organism context. So, I mean, it would be clearly great to integrate, find a way of defining those in a way that can be integrated. So I guess it, it's relevant to the ISA, the ROC rate, maybe the ELN, which I guess ELN is electronic lab notebook. Uh, so all of those, it would be, uh, and, uh, and also the protocols, because obviously protocols IO, it's about defining the procedure. So um, thinking together of how best to do this is uh, in, in a way that is shareable, it's uh, definitely uh, of interest. But we're just, yeah. Judith, did you want to add anything before Rahula goes? Well, um, I don't know if it's um, uh, a good thing to, to mention it here, but um, one, one thing that I find uh, another struggle we have when we want to properly document an experiment for reproducibility and, and open science. Um, I'm still trying to figure a way, along with Katerina and our colleagues here, is, is to document sample preparation um, and experimental design. Um, it's, I don't know how this would be linked in here, but it's, it's more than just the vendor is who prepared the, the sample and, and how, how we can trace back the various conditions and what so on that will have an effect on the final image that we're looking at. So I think, okay, maybe that would do something, but this is also important information to gather if we want to reproduce an experiment. Yeah, in the morning session, the, the with vendors just meant, please write it into the file, like don't lose it, right? So, <laughs> um, but yeah, we'll have to see if that can happen. Go for it, Rahul. Thanks for the presentation, uh, Josh, it was really clear. I think very nice. And I just wanted to mention, like we had in the beginning, like um, we are also trying to have something more in RDF formats as a metadata. 
So also for the data which goes into Omero in Leiden. And we had some first attempts to do that and to see how that works. But I think the main part we were missing was it's still like the OMI, like some kind of OMI ontology, like how to describe a channel, because that's the main part where the entities go, like usually using some kind of fluorophore or something which describes like a, a which is described in a channel. Mm -hmm. So it would, so I don't know how far that is and, and also how you would envision like if you would have eventually some RDF metadata, which can be provided within like, because now we attach the metadata templates as an attachment to Omero, but there is no, not, yeah, I mean, how would you see that, envision that in the future? Like how would we go towards linking that to actual data? Yeah, that's, my, uh, yeah, kind of that's... common slash. That's going to be an interesting one. Um, don't have a great answer. So you could imagine a, a first step would be better defining the mapping between the key value pairs and RDF. And so there would be a, a well-defined way for if someone sends RDF to a mirror, store it in the key value pairs, and you should be able to get it back out. So that you know that's kind of the lowest hanging fruit. Um, conceivably, you could have a triple store in Omero, but that would take a lot of work. So um, yeah, I think what we're talking about here is are you know are we are we agreeing to try this and then we start building the the, the integrations with Omero on top of that. So it's still early early days. But also like this whole May ontology is there like because there was some work done already I think is that but it was not like really as an ontology available on bioportal or somewhere like yeah it's it's not a bioportal use... it's from from norio it's and i guess we'll look yeah. at it in in some of the upcoming slides it's on gitlab um and a step could be to just adopt that as the, as the starting point um i guess the argument i'm going to make here is let's try to adopt something at one lo level higher of abstraction um and i'll give an example of what i would like to try um, so a different representation that would be able to generate the OME out. So talk about that in just a second. Eric? So yeah, the two things that Jack said would be, and they kind of cross between items you have there. Um, what we want to do on our side is to have the information be connected to a limb system. So that would be kind of like inside experimental context, I would, I would imagine. Um, and essentially where we, we are coming to that from the direction of trying to map things to an ISO model, because we are also from the other side trying to map the limb stuff into the same ISO model to connect the two things. Um, so we kind of go across two things here, I guess, between like integrating with a, 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 an ISO model and also with the limb system, not necessarily as two separate things, but as, a, but as the same thing, kind of more or less. Mm-hmm. Noted, I'll keep working on the notes. Uh, Katerina? Yeah, I just wanted to mention that, you know, the regarding the channel, um, the OMI model had something about the channel and the NBOQ is definitely, has definitely uh, worked on that and we're planning to continue working on it. So um, one one place where we could uh, talk about this is for example, the Quarib, the Quarib metadata, uh, which is open to anybody that wants to come and that could be part of a conversation we have. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, I'll try to get through the rest of my slides. That'll mean we can have kind of a, another extended conversation um, after, yeah, afterwards. We'll see how much time we have. Um, so I'll start off with a a, a brief history of attempts on the OME side to extend metadata. Um, you know, so laid out before the break, these are the things that we would like to make possible. How do we interoperate with them? And we've tried various things. Um, and I guess to some degree, what I'm getting at after this is, well, we need something new. Um, 
work began on, or the first versions of OME XSD came out in 2003, sorry. And that was, you know, the kind of the standard, the 5D model. Um, before that, there was a version of uh, the OME server so written in Perl that some of you may know about. Um, and it was actually much more flexible. It actually had some of the capabilities that we're talking about here in the sense that you could, what was it? If you imported an image that had metadata that was unknown to the system, it would automatically generate new tables in the Postgres database and, and you would have new metadata in your system. Um, it was impressive, uh, but not necessarily that easy to maintain. And so there's a, there's a that's probably the core trade-off that we're dealing with here from the point of view of everyone who's trying to build the, the software infrastructure to, to support bioimaging is a system can be uh, very flexible um, or kind of uh, maintainable. <laughs> uh, and it's finding a way to balance those two. So what's the right point in the spectrum uh, for us to all exist? Um, so kind of going along with our history, so one, so the choice that Omero made uh, so coming along in, I guess, roughly 2006, was to take the representation of OME XSD and generate all the other components that, that were needed for, for building and using the system. Um, yeah, I'll let everyone keep talking about Corp in the chat. Um, so that still powers Omero today. So this is the system uh, that we use. Um, you know, I think millions, if not tens of millions of lines of code get generated and there's all this stuff that goes into inside and into the web client and it, it's kind of everywhere. The downside is it's a um, it's a uh, significant task to update the model. So it's a, a large project. Um, and other than the core team, uh, really the only person who's ever gotten their their head around using it in a in a kind of a, the flexible manner that link metadata would provide was John Luigi and his team at CR, CSR4, CRS4. Um, and they used uh, the, the generation at the heart of Omero to build things that, you know, the rest of uh, OME land had no idea about. Um, but it's not something that I would really suggest to anyone else. Um, and so we're still kind of trying to find a, a solution that provides something similar, but is less cost to maintain. Um, we saw that very much when we uh, developed the high content screening model in 2008. Um, it was a multi-year process. I think something going on like three years of talking to people to come up with this model um, and then build it into the system and generate all of these artifacts and update how everyone works. Um, and so it's it's a significant process that one has to be, you know, one has to factor in those costs. So something we did to, to reduce the cost is then to go more towards flexibility. Uh, in 2010, introduce structured annotations. Um, so this is what they look like in the XML. So you have a block and in that block, you can talk about various parts of the metadata. You can talk about images or you can talk about products and you can just, uh, pro projects, excuse me, and you can just attach information. And that was to let people add a little bit of metadata, um, but not completely re rework the model. Um, we went a step further towards that in 2013 with the key value pairs, um, knowing that was so a little bit more power, um, again, to try to keep people from asking for too many changes to the model. Um, and then we realized in 2015, when we started to work on the IDR, that the key value pairs are can do quite a lot. And much of what you see in kind of the right-hand panel of the IDR is uh, our key value pairs. Um, but some of the user interaction, for example, if you want these things to be clickable, that wasn't quite clear how to make that happen. So what the IDR did, so the the, the client, the, the web client in the IDR says, well, if there are two key value terms and the second key value term um, is a URL, then apply that URL to the previous and make it clickable. So you know, we're, we're starting to, to build rules on top of, of these key value pairs. And so we're basically building up a language. So we're we're saying, well, we need we need more of a framework. We need more flexibility, more power, um, and that takes you away from the main maintainability. So, for example, this code isn't something that we've rolled out to other Omeros just because that takes work, and so it's 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 always the same struggle. And so that's kind of where we have left things, and 
we got to the point where with Omero and with IDR, we could provide, you know, a pretty good point on the spectrum and we could provide the features that we wanted. Um, and then the rest of the community got involved and said, well, we, there are other features that we want to provide. Um, Susanna, who, I was just going to check if Susanna is still here. No, she's not. Um, wrote a tool called in, now called Endemic, the metadata editor for microscopy, because her users wanted to go in and actually change the values that are stored in the Omero database. So the, the, the values that got pulled out of the original metadata files, and that's not something we currently allow. Um, and so Endemic allows you to take the original metadata and then alter it and then save it back as an annotation. It's kind of an overlay on top of your data. Um, a completely valid um, use case, but this data is now a key value pair. And so is this how we actually want this to be stored long-term or do some of you have other use cases? So do we need more power again, right? To, to do this use, uh, to su support this use case properly. Similarly, what we all, we've already talked about in the case of um, NVOQ needing to extend some of the model, um, did that kind of down at the XSD level, but what that would have eventually turned into was then running that through the entire Omero pipeline and gener generating lots of new artifacts, um, which would be um, which would require a significant amount of work to to roll that out to all the users. So how do we balance that? Are we doing something like Rahula is talking about, where you take you know you generate the new file and you attach it in Omero, and so with say NBO X, NBOQ XML as opposed to RDF, or can we somehow find a balance where these things are, are represented more completely in Omero? Um, around 2018, um, Norio Kobayashi from Riken showed up. Uh, actually, he showed up with a finished product. He had, as Rolo was saying, he had already generated OME Al. And not only had he done that, he had then extended it. So he's he had he had solved the problem and then used it to to um to extend his own system, and that in particular for electron microscopy. Um, again, this is something that we could discuss adopting more widely, um, but I guess the argument I'll make in just a second is that the reason this hasn't happened yet is because what Norio produced, quite similar to what uh, Jean Luigi had done, was just a little bit too sophisticated or too complicated for mere mortals. Um, and we need we need some help to be able to use these systems that they that they realize are necessary and are powerful, um, but somehow we need a higher level of, of abstraction um, for us all to be able to work with this stuff on a regular daily basis. Um, and as has been mentioned in the chat and a couple of times during the conversation, you know the work with Corup and the vendors is moving forward. So there are things that are being specified. Um, at the level of cameras and you know, kind of working through all the components of the hardware, um, and we need a way to store all this. So again, so the use cases are there, um, and it's really about finding the right level of of the right balance of flexibility and maintainability in a framework that we can all use. Um, sorry, that was about two decades of history. Uh, everyone happy with that? Okay, so. What's been going on more recently? So what um, I and German Bioimaging with a couple of external uh, colleagues have been doing throughout 2022 uh, is I guess could I guess be called a linked data adventure. Um, as some of you may know, Jason is also program, so with a non-OME hat, is program director of Delta Tissue, which is a program from uh, Welcome Leap. Um, and it, they are tasked with building a tissue time machine. So there are 16 different teams. Um, a large portion of those are actually, you know, have patients under acquiring data um, on three different disease areas. So tuberculosis, glioblastoma, and triple negative breast cancer um, with a host of modalities. And the question is, can, can you predict tissue state based on the, the sum total of the data that they're acquiring? And they're off doing that. Um, with leaps and bounds. So it's a three-year project and they have a lot to do. Um, and you, as you can imagine, they have a data problem. Um, they're generating, you know, obviously imaging data, but non-imaging modalities as well. Some of that's just being stored um, in a Globus file store somewhere. Uh, some of it's being stored in Omero. There's tabular data. Um, and we were tasked with making all of this data linkable. So 
you know, this is basically a, a, a prototype project to say, can we take for, you know, just these three disease areas and these 16 groups who are generating data and link what they are producing and build something so that they, at least internally, so all of this is internal at the moment, uh, to Delta Tissue, can they discover each other's data sets? Can they search for them reasonably and then go on and generate methods and, and deep learning models and hopefully produce uh, clinical uh, diagnostics? And as you can imagine, the, the most of the data we have at the moment is tabular. So, you know, it's just kind of patient data and it's not a surprise whatsoever coming from the introduction that I gave that, uh, you know, you, it's uh, completely uh, standard Excel spreadsheets. Uh, we have long conversations with them to agree on the naming and the structure of those spreadsheets. And we turn that into linked data. Um, and then we make it possible for them to run Sparkle queries on it. Um, you know, and that process actually, so at a, at a technical level, um, works fine. The bigger problem is actually this agreement part of the conversation, right? So it's going back to this quote I, I gave at the beginning, RDF is, is, is probably the simplest thing that will work. The hard thing is, is what the world and what your data looks like. And so you just have to be aware that those are, those are things that you have to deal with. I'll give you an example. Um, this is the current pipeline. So each of the disease areas is sending us uh, tabular data. We have a separate Python pipeline for, for that data that they're producing that generates RDF. And then the tool that I'll show you in just a moment, it was just kind of the framework is a prototype framework that I think uh, may work for all of us. It's called LinkML. And we can use that to generate JSON-LD and then generate Markdown and, and the web page and other things that they're interested in. Um, but the model, so this isn't data, this is the model behind each one of these Python um, uh, Python pipelines, um, you, you can kind of get a feel for this isn't something that you really want to be doing at the RDF triple level. So you, you know, I can draw this in graph viz and I can write all of these individual ontology statements out, but you probably want something like a programming language to help you make this a little bit easier. And so that's what I want to talk about for the next bit. Um, LinkMLIO is the web page. Um, this is just a screenshots of the of the website, so you can go look at it yourself while I'm talking. Fundamentally, it's a you know this is what ML stands for, markup language. It's a format here written in YAML that lets you write down how linked data should be um, represented, and then it has tools for generating JSON or JSON LD. Um, but also has a fairly um, substantial generation of Python classes and things that developers tend to like for building up these systems, right? Um, if you're interested in um, seeing a kind of a real world example, probably the, the, the largest model that exists is called BioLink. It's a, um, a data schema that tries to rep, well, it doesn't try, it represents uh, genes, diseases, phenotypes, pathways, individuals, and substances. So actually quite a lot of what's already represented in the IDR. Um, I haven't looked into whether or not, so this isn't a part of Delta Tissue, whether or not, you know, we could actually adopt parts of, or all of BioLink um, in toto, or is it just an example of what we might want to build up as a community? Or do we want to build up several of these for each of our individual use cases? So those are the kinds of questions really that I, I'm interested in hearing from all of you, what, what you would like to see happen here, right? And if we go to a hello world, just so you can get a kind of a, a feeling for how the, the platform works, uh, this is a YAML file. It's the simplest one I could create. All the stuff at the top is boilerplate. Um, and really, I'm saying there's an image and an image has a name. You know, that's that's the full extent of what the Hello World does. And then there are a lot, there are tools to take that and then generate. So here I'm generating the owl output. And so in my mind, this is something of what Norio provided for us. He did the hard work of writing all this by hand. Um, but if possible, I sure would like a simple representation that we can then share and have these very concrete conversations that Katerina is talking about. Okay, let's sit down and let's model X, whatever X is as a community um, and be able to see, you know, for, for the computationalist, you know, on GitHub, can I have a diff, a change of the, of the metadata such that it's, it's reasonable and I actually know what happened. 
Um, that's kind of what I'm going for. And maybe we can even go farther to the left here on the screen. Uh, I guess my finger is pointing in the wrong direction. Um, can we go even farther and have an even higher level representation that we're all using? And that question, I don't know. I've only begun experimenting with link ML. So here are the schema transformations um, that I've experimented with with link ML. These are, um, I guess I can, I'll get to that in a second. Um, so we've looked at link ML to OWL. You can then go down and generate um, the Pydantic models, i.e. so Python classes. Um, and then once you're in Pydantic, you can really do anything that Pydantic ca can. So for example, you can generate uh, entity relationship models, which is something that Katerina has been doing by hand. You know, so part of this is driven by the fact that Katerina's workflow is currently very time consuming and difficult for her. You know, can we ease some of the pains that we have? And I guess we're interested also in hearing what the rest of you have as pain points, and maybe we can make those easier as well. Um, you can also generate JSON schema. We've been generating JSON schema by hand, excuse me, <clears throat> for NGFF. NGFF is fairly simple when it comes to a model, but it's going to get more and more complicated. So would this be a solution perhaps uh, for representing the metadata in NGFF? And you can represent JSON LD context. Um, one other kind of ex uh, a special case here is the spreadsheet. Um, so one thing that the NBOQ community has been doing is, well, many of their conversations take place looking at schema. So there's a, um, a long list of all the attributes for the, for the equipment that needs discussing. Um, and LinkML does have support for taking such a spreadsheet and generating LinkML. I looked into whether or not we could generate the spreadsheet from the YAML. That doesn't quite work. But these are all things that if there is value to us as a community, um, I think the developers who are here could add to them and you know the, the framework in that sense is quite extensible. Um, and so it very much gives me the feeling of this pipeline that we have for Romero. You know, so this is, uh, is it fair to say, you know, I wrote most of this and some of this is the ugliest code I ever, ever wrote. Um, I, I, I actively point people to one particular file here to scare them away during interviews. It's, um, it's horrific. And so if I could find a nice clean framework to, to replace that with, I would be a very happy person, right? So that's kind of the feeling of where we want to go with this. Um, the other thing that LinkML does, and I thought this was quite exciting, is it also does data transformation. So once you have your schema representation, you can use that as kind of like the, the, the scaffolding to then move your data around with as well. My primary hope was that I could do this with the tabular data. Uh, that I could take, you know, just someone's bog standard Excel spreadsheet and I could generate RDF. That's still kind of my primary use case. If I can make that happen, eventually I'll be a very happy person. Um, it's not working yet. And that's largely for various design decisions that um, I think needed to be discussed with the, the LinkML project themselves. But what definitely works is once you have the RDF, you can then generate JSON and JSON-LD and YAML and, and other representations. The only thing you have to do is decide what part of the graph are you starting from? So just for a quick example, um, you say, I want to convert from turtle, i.e. RDF into JSON using the OME schema. And I want to pick out all the images. So find all the images in this entire graph and then show them to me. And then you get a JSON uh, data representation that you can then take and do something else with. So this might be something that Omero would use internally, you know, back to Rahola's use case, someone's coming with RDF, you give it to Omero, okay, I, I'm going to turn this into something else that I deal with internally, but then I'll do the reverse when I go back out, right? So it's always this process of, um, so Omero is, uh, is very um, opinionated in what it's going to do and how it's going to do things. And I think we need to be better at dealing with other communities that say, well, I want to do something different. How do we bridge those, those multiple communities, right? Um, oh, there are several other generators that I haven't tested. And if anyone has particular need for those, feel free to give them a try, uh, like Protobuffer and GraphQL and Alchemy and kind of very particular um, computational needs. Um, someone has worked on them, but I didn't need them, so I haven't done anything there. Um, and But what's really key is that what LinkML, so this is a more complicated example, and I didn't um, uh, is that you can import existing um, models 
and that you can either do locally on the file system or you could do on a server. So you could imagine a vendor putting up their YAML file and then you would import that. You know, if you want to say, well, I just got data from my Microsoft, or maybe even your microscope has its own YAML file. I don't know. You know, the, the sky is kind of the limit. Um, but once you've imported those files, then you kind of have the same tools that we've already talked about. So it, again, it's this kind of consistent way to deal with any of these features. Um, and I don't think we'll get there, but, you know, so these, as I promised earlier, these are the channel uh, values that are currently in the IDR, at least up to IDR 109. And as you can see, there's just this kind of huge diversity. And I'm pretty sure that it's a social issue. Can we have the conversation? But that everything that's written down there could be represented in LinkML, right? And so that's kind of um, a litmus test of would it let us do what we need to do? Uh, thanks, Will. So this is kind of the last concept. It's the last new thing that I think I'll be introducing. And just very briefly, um, something else we tried is, OK, you can use LinkML to, and this pipeline we have to get data out of tabular uh, format and into to RDF. Can we do the same thing with RD, uh, with uh, Omero? Um, the, we wanted to test kind of for size, because we wanted to make sure that we would be ready for um, all the data that was coming from the performers. And so we took the biggest data set, the HPA, um, and wrote kind of specialized SQL and specialized kind of parallel processing. And eventually we got the RDF that came out to about 200 million triples. Um, and that's 2% of Wikidata, which doesn't sound reasonable. And maybe I've made a mistake somewhere in the math, but I know that was very large and it took me a lot of time. So I need to go back and check the numbers. Uh, but to have one study be... 2% of all of what's in Wikidata probably points to the fact that we need to be careful when we're doing this. So it's not just that you want to share every triple in every situation. Um, and in my mind, you can kind of think about it like this. So you know, you have the HPA, you have the projects in Omero. Each of those have data sets. Those each have images. Those each have all their key value pairs. Maybe in some cases, you want to get rid of some of those internal hops, right? You can um, the best, so semantically compress is a term I, I, I'm using. I don't know if it's valid. I need to check that. But, you know, you can basically, as a community, could we say that we can take out some parts of the, the overall graph and share this reduced hierarchy, this reduced graph, and let people search on it? Um, you know, so if someone comes to your platform, they search for gene A, they will find study but then they'll have to go to a marrow to figure out what's in that study. So I think that's valid, um, but I'm not exactly sure how we would use that in production. If someone wants to play around with this Omero to RDF um, code, that's up on GitHub. It's very much alpha. But one of the big problems when you are when you sit down at a blank file <laughs> to write RDF is you need to have URLs. So you know, going back to the, the five stars, one probably one of the biggest values of RDF and linked data is the fact that everything is a URL. But when you're just trying to get started and you don't have the URLs yet, it's very tricky. It's kind of a chicken and the egg problem. So I think this will help people who, to get a feel for what's going on uh, or what RDF from Omero might look like. But we very much need to go back and have, so basically I've cheated and these URLs are just kind of made up but we will need to make sure that we, oh, excuse me, that we have good URLs, long-term URLs that we're all happy with supporting um, for the foreseeable future. And really, in the case of Omero, that comes down to, you know, is there a plugin in Omero that generates nice URLs that the user can click on for all time? Um, and that's an open discussion. All right, we're kind of getting to the end. And as I said, I. Still kind of interested in if any of you have feedback on where you see yourself fitting in this kind of web of metadata schemas. Um, I'll just summarize real quick. We talked about what linked data is. Uh, hopefully the, the introductions didn't go too quickly. Um, we went through various problems, i.e. interesting things to do in the FAIR data space. Talked about the fact that um, certainly for the next five years, NFDI for bioimaging will be pursuing solutions, but we know that some of you are as well. So um, obviously very interested in working together. Um, 
think there's a good potential to, to use RDF as a common, as the common low level. Um, if anyone thinks there is a different low level that we can use, please speak up. Um, and LinkML is kind of the best candidate I found to date for a higher le level framework that we can all build on. Um, concretely, I think we keep pushing on training. So I'll keep talking about this to people and preparing more material. Hopefully it resonates with some or many or all of you. Um, if we can find more funding for this, perhaps for very concrete projects. So if anyone knows, I'm, you know, I don't really care about what you're talking about, Josh, with all this linked data stuff, but I need to get, you know, A into B. Let's talk about what A into B means, and maybe we can frame that in the linked data space. So you would be kind of moving with us towards this, uh, this end goal. We ultimately need to make RDF more accessible to people. So how do we take what, for example, Norio has done and bring that to everyone? Um, probably concretely what that means is from my side is to start building, um, representing the OME model in LinkML. And that's something that obviously I'll share. And maybe that will be kind of the, the starting point where everyone can, can get involved. Or perhaps, um, if someone finds another framework, we can talk. So maybe there can't be one framework that does everything for all of us, but I'll say that, you know, the smaller number, the smallest number of frameworks that we can find, uh, the better, because otherwise we'll get ourselves into a bioformats problem. And basically we'll be spending our time translating our metadata, just like we spend our time translating our image formats, right? And I'd like to avoid that as possible because the, the more, things that we use in common, the more tools we can build together and you know, make our users happy. Um, so yeah, quick thanks uh, obviously to all the funders on the Dundee side and now new slide to all the funders on the German bioimaging side. Uh, he, ah, Jason, did you make it back? So I definitely wanted to say thanks to Jason for kind of saving me from Germany many years ago and letting me work for lovely Scotland. Uh, for the say the past uh, 15, 16 years. Uh, and also thanks to Steffi for now giving me a job in Germany, I guess. Uh, and I guess that's another way of saying that's uh, very exciting to, to have a growing OME community. And thanks to all of you uh, for paying attention for some of you late at night. So thanks. Sure. I'm not disappearing. I just have to switch cameras. Okay. So what are the thoughts? So what resonates, what doesn't resonate? Any worries? Go for it, Eric. I saw some nodding. So at least there's that. Yeah. So I guess where I am is that on the technical side of things, I love it. Like i I want a world where all data is linked. Um, my worries are always on the implementation side of things, right? So it's like, do we have the tools to make this easy for developers to use, for vendors to use, for users to use more importantly? And the big, the big metadata barrier is always, do the researchers care enough to actually, because at some point they are, they are the responsible at the end of the line to, to actually have this metadata there, right? So um, I, and I know we are not at a, at a place to worry about the tools just yet because we don't, we don't even have like what we are actually building towards. Uh, so yeah, I mean, just, just in general, I am 100% on board with the technical side of things, love it. Um, it needs to be built with that in mind. And that's that's all, yeah. Anyone wanna add on to that specifically? So I'll just add, um, so I think that goes back to, so maybe we can, I'll do a, I'll, maybe I'll start there. So I think that's part of why it's the right time. Um, so around linked metadata, I think there's more going on at the moment than there has ever been before. Um, libraries are very 
uh, into this. There's a lot of funding into it. You know, EOSC is behind it. Um, so I think to some ex to some degree, that gives me hope because that means we're not building like all the documentation for what all this stuff is about. So there will be a body of work that's out there. And if we build on top of the frameworks in the right way, we can say, read all this material and then come back and talk to me, right? Um, or there'll be videos and YouTube. So certainly um, what's going on in the German space is right now, if you kind of follow hashtag NFDI, you see all these people talking about this because there are a large number of people who have been hired all with the same task of make the data linked, right? And so there's just a lot of activity. Now, I don't have a great feeling for how much activity there is in, in the other spaces, but I know uh, Jason and Bioimaging UK are going to start working on, a, you know, training and focus on how do we get all this material out there. So if we can time all of this right, and really at each of our national levels, we're going, okay, <laughs> we've all made this agreement. This is what we're going to be presenting to you. Um, we might be able to do a better job of than saying, okay, here is, you know, just the Omero stack that we all kind of wrote in our basement starting, you know, 2005 um, and, and have some, be part of something larger. So that's, that's exciting. Um, thanks. I think Katrina was first, but I'll I'll, I'll take it anyway. <laughs> um, so I, I did put it into the uh, uh, into the HackMD um, this uh, question of um, translating from the the previous, the legacy, all the all the the existing uh, type of data is still something that we do need to address. I, I understand that we'd like to build forward and implement with a forward view. But um, there is that enormous bonus of data that um, that needs to be translated. So I agree. Getting back into a bioformats uh, regime is probably not the way. But providing some kind of connector um, and to making it possible for somebody who has this one big bonus of data with a specific schema or or, or ontology to connect in and, and translate in uh, one time, hopefully, not, not, not like bioformats where it's continuously. Yeah, so if I actually had hoped that all of those, that old data would still be readable by newer versions of the vendor software, I would say, let's work towards, so, when we've built a framework that the vendors could adopt to do this with new data, perhaps it would run on old data, but that's obviously a big ask. So I think you're right. There's definitely going to be a mid range of, of data that we're not going to be able to, to, to have as richly annotated as we would like. Katarina? Just wanted to um, mention that in um, as part of Quare, um, we are working on uh, Matthias uh, Hammer, who is I don't think is here, and I are working on using the LinkML framework. So, one as as uh, Josh was mentioning, one of the things that we do is we need to have some kind of representation of the model of the schema that is readable by um, humans, so that people can get feedback. And so we we have been using a, a spreadsheet. And the beauty of LinkML is that it does allow to have a spreadsheet as a starting point. So we're working toward figuring out whether this scheme and this, uh, this spreadsheet is called schema sheet as far as the uh, LinkML world is concerned. And so we are working to see if we can use that. And it looks very promising. So that, that would be, um, I mean, that's just an example of uh, something that... Um, in that that makes it uh, possible for LinkML to be actually a very useful. I mean, it's it looks like LinkML is going to be a very big help, and so if we can uh, work around that and maybe add things that are missing, that would be great because it looks like it has a lot of what we need. So, for what it's worth, Katarina, Matthew actually said the same thing this morning, which was also very encouraging. So, that's a good first step. Anyone else want to add anything? All 
I went over by about five minutes this morning, so I'm kind of inclined to just let you all out <laughs> five minutes early <laughs> to balance out my um my karma. Anyone want to jump in? So there's certainly some of you that we haven't heard from yet. You're obviously welcome to. There are actually some names that I've I've I people I don't know at all. And so uh, certainly OME meetings tend to be much more touchy feely and open and you know feel free to jump in. Going once. Twice. Awesome. Well, thank you all for coming. Good to, I guess, see some of you. Um, it's good that all of you are here, though. Take care. Um, there will be some form of follow-up. The video will get posted, and uh, we can keep the conversation going. So take care, everyone.